Well, good morning, everyone. It's snowing in Scotland this morning, so uh, we're fortunate to be over here for two final days. So we come to the last chapter of this particular set of studies, and uh, uh, we, we've passed that center point, haven't we, now? And uh, in, in some ways, from a human perspective, from a purely physical perspective, it seems as though everything is going downhill now. Um, our bodies no longer work quite as effectively as they used to. I look down at my hands, and I remember as a child, looking at my dad's hands when he was in his 40s and, you know, thinking obviously they were different to mine. And I look down at my hands now and I see my dad's hands. And there are many things about my father that I admire a great deal. And there are other things uh, which I won't talk about because he might listen to these, uh, these recordings. Um, but, um, you know, you realize that actually you are. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're following the same course to some degree. And, uh, well, that's something that Anita is going to have to deal with. <laughs> so we see this in the Bible too, of course. Um, David couldn't get warm, could he, at the end of his life. Barzillai had no taste. Isaac could not see. Asa became diseased in his feet. These are just some of the symptoms of what aging can bring. And of course, as we stand, you know, if we're not yet at that stage, and as we stand and, and, and think about what it might be, none of us knows, do we? It's in, it's in God's hands, and there may be certain tendencies that we can see genetically in our families and certain patterns, so we might have some expectations. But really, it is a future unknown to us. And so from that point of view, for me, in preparing these thoughts, this, we're now going into the area of my greatest incompetence. Um, and, and yet, I find that it's something I think about quite a lot. I don't know if that's because I'm just a particularly morbid kind of person, uh, or uh, whether this is the case for all of us as we, as we go through that mid-life uh, stage and we think of what the future might bring. But I remember uh, to the extent that we are anxious about that or that we do think about that um, with, with some concern or worry. I read a number of things in, in, in researching, including actually a TED talk by Jane Fonda, of all people, which, <laughs> which was actually quite, quite interesting, um, where, where, she, where she talks about when you're inside oldness, fear subsides. Um, and there are blessings to be associated with it too, um, not just this physical deterioration. That's one aspect of it which, which we need to approach with faith and come to terms with in the sight of God. Uh, but there are other aspects too which uh, might be thoroughly positive. But perhaps it's... Uh, it's the words of Jesus to Peter that capture most powerfully uh, the latter stages of the aging uh, process as we approach uh, the final curtain of, of this life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whithersoever thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. And there can be that ignominy of losing our facilities, our faculties, can't there? A, a forbidding anticipation of that. Our, our, and the world shrinks down then. And the illusion of control is broken, isn't it? To the extent that others do gird us and, and have control and say, this is where you're going to be staying now. And, and hopefully it's, you know, it's a mutual decision. Um, but but it, it, there is this loss of control, the shrinking of the, wor of, of the world. There is that God has deliberately built into the pattern of our lives this potential for this second childhood as we approach back to where we came from. We came from the dust of the ground and unto dust we shall return. And that is God's decree, isn't it? And therefore it is right. And our ability to accept that then in a measure with faith 
and with trust that God is doing what is right and with hope, is a one, that's a wonderful opportunity actually to express faith. There's that poem, isn't there, that talks about raging against the dying of the light as a man or a woman approaches death. And we can understand that. We can understand that frustration, that anger, and, and it is instinctive in us, and it is built into us in the sense that God has put that longing for the eternal in our hearts. It is instinctive to us to desire to live and not die. We long for life. And yet, ours is not a rage, but an acceptance. We pray that it would be that, I imagine. I pray that it would be that for me, that God is just, and that God has blessed us richly uh, during the, 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 the course of our lives. So. We've already started to answer the question, what is, what is God telling us by the aging process? What is God telling us by this mockery of us? And there is a sense in which it is a mockery. You know, we, we, we thought we were so smart, so clever, so powerful. You know, we amassed all these things around us to say, look at me, as it were, uh, for our hearts full of pride. I, I imagine we've all been there in some way or other at some point in our lives. Pride, I think, is, is, is a sin that, uh, that I imagine we all grapple with. And this is the great unpicking of that. What pride can we have in, you know, in the things that aging can bring? And, and of course, many of us are blessed by God, and, and, and it, you know, it, it, all the, the, uh, the, you know, the ugliness, let's say, that it can bring is not necessarily, um, uh, you know, may not be ours, and, and, and then that's a wonderful blessing from God. Um, but, but, but what is it that God is telling us? Well, it, it, it is an, an unraveling of life as it must be. As he came forth from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a sore evil that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit hath he that hath labored for the winds? And, and, and you can see that balancing in that passage, can't, it? can't you? As he came, so shall he grow. He didn't bring anything into the world, and it's certain that he'll take uh, nothing out. And so it is um, by God's decree. And there is that incredible poem. We're not going to look at it, but uh, we referred to it in the first talk, that incredible poem in the, uh, in the last chapter of Ecclesiastes that describes the aging uh, uh, process which, uh, which ends in death. But our gracious acceptance of that is a submission to God's wisdom and to His sentence. And that's right, isn't it, to try to approach it in that way. Let's take a psalm. We're going to take two main passages, both from the psalms, actually, two of my favorite psalms um, for our, the, most of our time uh, this morning. Psalm 90. And I'd just like us to take a moment, if you, can, if you can turn to Psalm 90, and we're just going to scan through it and look for, um, well, let's take a look at the first verse. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. So it starts off about God then and about the eternity of God and his eternity in relation to our experience. God has been our dwelling place in all generations. Whatever has come and gone, whatever has happened, God has been there. He has always been there, and He always will be. He is defined uh, by eternity then. And, and so the concept of time is introduced there, all these generations. But this is something which carries on in verse after verse. What about verse 2? Can you see any references to time in verse 2? Before 
That's a time word, isn't it? Before the mountains were brought forth, uh, um, or thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. More time words. Um, what about what about verse four? For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. More terms relating to uh, time. And as a watch in the night. Um, what about verse? What about verse? Uh, verse five. Can you say anything there that relates to time? Just call it out if you spot anything. Uh, Psalm 90, and we're in verse 5. Nine zero. The morning, right? So we've got the morning now. Um, and in verse, uh, in verse 6, we've got the morning again, and we've got the evening, right? What else do we have? Verse 9. Days. Any more? Years. Verse 10, days, years, three score years and 10, four score years. Soon at the end of the verse. Verse 12, days again. Verse 13, how long? Yeah. Verse 14, early, days. Verse 15, days again, years. Yep. So it's, it's right through the psalm, isn't it? And if you, you know, if you were to make a list of all those time words, there's, there's loads of them in the psalm. The whole psalm is about time and how God relates to time and how, how we relate to time. And of course, there's going to be a huge contrast set up then, isn't there, between God and ourselves. So we begin, we begin with thinking about God and time before the mountains were brought forth, even to, from everlasting to everlasting, He is God. So, so, so that's the backdrop then, the eternity of God, but it quickly changes in verse three. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, return, ye children of men. So we're not like that then, are we? This is Ecclesiastes 1 all over again in which the eternity of God and of nature is contrasted with our shortness of days. Um, and how great that contrast is because a thousand years in God's sight are but as yesterday when it is past and a watch in the night. And, uh, you know, you think, well, you know, what did you do last Tuesday, um, the Tuesday before the conference? You know, I imagine if I thought hard, particularly because I was in a different environment to usual because I was in Australia, I could just about remember what I did. Could I remember what I had for lunch? Probably not. Um, and it's interesting, when we look backwards, time collapses, doesn't it? And in a few weeks' time, this Bible school that has been, what will it have been by the end of it, nine days altogether, will just have collapsed down to a single moment, won't it, in our memories of, you know, oh, the Bible school was good, or oh, the Bible school was this or that, whatever our impression of it was. And everything that's been said will collapse down to that, won't it? If, if, if anything that's been said can be remembered. Um, and this is, this is how time is for us. It's, it's this collapsible uh, thing which is, which, is, which, is, which is folded up and put away. It's like the grass that's mown down, isn't it? And then is gone. Um, like a watch in the night. Uh, thou carriest them away our days as a flood. They are as a sleep. And probably most of us can't remember the moment that we went to sleep last night. And, you know, you don't have a re recollection of that, do you? And suddenly that was eight hours or five hours or whatever it was, um, and it's just gone, and, you, and you've no recollection of it. And the time that is past is like that. In the morning it flourishes, and, and then in the evening it's cut down and withereth. Now, why is this? Well, there's two things going on in the psalm. Uh, at one level, this is a parable about Israel, and it's about why is it that Israel's days have been cut short, and why is it that Israel has gone into captivity? 
I think. So it's about the days of Israel and the shortness of those days. And we know why God, Israel went into captivity and went, why God um, you know, removed the diadem and took off the crown and said, this shall not be the same. It was because of Israel's sin and, and God was angry with her for that. And so it's no surprise then when you read verse seven, for we are consumed by thy anger and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee and our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Verse 11 again talks about the anger of God. So the reason why Israel's days were so short is because of God's anger then. That you had to be, the kingdom had to be removed because of their sinfulness. But So that's one level of thinking about this psalm. But of course the broader level is to think about the human experience more broadly, isn't it? And say, why are our days so short? Well, we know why they're short because Genesis 3 tells us it's because of sin. And God's anger at our sinfulness and the fact that you cannot have in a world in which God's plans are to be accomplished, a world populated by immortal sinners, can you? And so there must be death. And so God had to bring death into the world. And so our days are shortened. And and, and you see that in those chapters of Genesis, don't you, where the lifespans are shortened from the hundreds of years of the of the, uh, of, of the, of the uh, before the, you know, in Genesis 1 to 11, and then it's shortened down to 120 or so years, and then it's shortened down again, and this psalm speaks of the three score years and 10. It's because of the wickedness of man. And isn't that then what makes verse 3 spring to life? Thou turnest man to destruction. And <clears throat> it's as if God's holding up a stop sign, isn't it? And here we are merrily going on in our life full of excitement and busyness and enterprise and suddenly God's hand is up and says, okay, that's enough. That is your time. Look at what it says in the next phrase of verse three, thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, return ye children of men. And where does that word come from? Return there, comes from Genesis three, doesn't it? For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So everything to do with the shortness of our days then, and this aging process, is a reminder to us that uh, the sentence we own is just. And that we must return to the earth, and the Spirit must return to God who gave it until the time comes for the Lord Jesus Christ to return and for those who sleep in the dust of the earth to awake to newness of life. So we've, we, we, we've, thought about, um, we've thought about the problem and we've thought about the, the, the why of it. We've, we, we've understood from this psalm the reasons for our mortality. But the psalm does not leave us there with those uh, sad thoughts. On the contrary, uh, just like the book of Ecclesiastes and just like Romans 8, uh, it, it is a psalm which, which is filled with optimism um, and, uh, and encouragement for us. And of course, that encouragement begins in verse 12. So, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. And that's what this today theme is all about, isn't it? This is how we have the potential to make the most of today, to make the most of our opportunities, whatever they are in what stage, ever stage of life uh, we are at, that we number our days, that we realize the limitations and constraints upon us, and that we thank God for every moment of breath that he gives us as an opportunity to reflect back to him his glory. Return, O Lord. How long, it says in, uh, in verse 13. Do you notice that? We've met that word before, haven't we? God held up the stop sign and said, return, ye children of men. Return to the grave. And now, in this verse 13, the psalmist flips that on its head and says, uh, before I return to the grave, Lord, return to me and save me 
and have mercy upon me. Return, O Lord, how long? Don't go away. Remember how short my time is. Remember how fragile and flimsy my, I am and my days are in comparison to your eternity. And be gracious to me and have mercy upon me. Let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Do you see that? O oh, satisfy us early. Don't leave it too late, Lord, because we don't have long. Satisfy us now with thy mercy. We need it now, even today, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Now, isn't that a wonderful thing then, that this truth about our current existence is not a reason for sorrow? Because God has returned to us and he has sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to save us. And therefore, we may rejoice and we should be glad all our days, even in the declining days of our lives because of what he has done for us. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us and the years wherein we have seen evil. But God says, I'm going to do better than that because these days in which God does afflict us and which we see the evils of human nature and the necessary consequences of that, those days are but a span, aren't they? They're just a short hair's breadth and God will not reward us in proportion to that. It's massively disproportionate, isn't it? The rewards that God promises for us because those rewards are to spend eternity in his presence and to be like him, which is what was always the plan for us. That's the vision that we have and that's the joy that fills our hearts therefore. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. Let me forget about my works and the, you know, the sandcastles that I'm building. And let me think about the great works of God and the beauty of the Lord. Let that be upon us. One of the things that happens with aging, of course, is that our beauty deserts us, doesn't it, to some measure. And we try and put that off and we go through all these processes. And Brother Joe, in one of the short and sharp sessions yesterday, was showing us how, you know, even the most beautiful models get touched up and, and you know, all the images get changed and no one actually looks like what you see in the magazines. Um, um, and, uh, and of course, as, as we age, we do that more and more, don't we? To try to reclaim that youth that is disappearing from us. And this again flips that on its head and says, let the beauty of the Lord be upon us because that's a beauty that lasts forever. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. And if that happens then, what we are building in this life is not a sandcastle which the tide will wash away. It is, uh, it, it, it is a, a life uh, and an inward man, a woman of spiritual qualities which God will establish, which we build step by step through his word, ever growing unto the measure of that perfect man and the stature of the fullness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, uh, let's consider for a few moments now uh, just a couple of other lessons then that come from aging. And there, are certainly, uh, there, there is certainly a warning to us in, in the scriptures when we think of um, older people uh, and physical age can be a parable and a warning about spiritual decay, uh, decay and, and, and decline. So just, just, just think of that. The deterioration of the sight of Isaac, which accompanied his aging, was, uh, actually spoke of something more serious, didn't it? It spoke of a lack of discernment that he had in his family, a lack of discernment about what the right thing to do was in terms of the blessing of his children, and, and a certain stubbornness that was there in his character despite the, because he knew what God had said, and yet here he was uh, trying to do something different, and thus he ended up trembling with that great trembling uh, greatly. Or we think of the inaction of Eli, that old man who had failed to uh, instruct his children or having instructed them had, had, had failed really to um, get, that, uh, get that message home. And, and in, 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 his, um, in the dimness of his eyes and, and, and um, 
there's again a parable about, about spiritual failure and inaction. It was when he was old, the record tells us, that Solomon's wives turned away his heart. It was when Asa was old that he became diseased in his feet, as we've already mentioned, and did not seek the Lord. He knew he should have sought the Lord, but somehow he, he just... Uh, didn't bother or didn't think that God would help him with this or was relevant in this particular circumstance, who can know what it was? Um, And in in all these examples, it's as if these uh, these men in this case have have somehow lost something of their spiritual uh, verve and drive and clarity of sight, the the, the, the gumption, if you like, spiritual gumption. Um, they, they've lost the impetus to say, here's something that needs addressing and I will, sort, I will try to sort it out with God's help. There's a little bit of the, I'm too old for this. And while it might well be true that we say I'm too old for uh, various things, it might be very wise to do that in some cases uh, for particular activities, that wouldn't be the case from a, a, physical, a spiritual perspective, would it? Because that growth is something that's meant to, uh, to continue as we age. And this is what is paradoxical about it, that though our outward man or woman ages, our inward man is renewed and continues to grow, and that aging provides particular opportunities for that growth. There is that space to breathe, isn't there? We were talking about that yesterday and the pressures of earlier stages of life that make it very hard to catch your breath. And now that opportunity uh, starts to to come more easily, a time to be with God um, more consistently perhaps, with less distractions um, in life. And the scriptures then speak of that too then. If there's that warning, let let me not age spiritually, um, the the scriptures also speak of uh, the the glories of age and uh, the the beauty of of the the wisdom and experience uh, distilled down in in a life and in a, in a spiritual life. Proverbs 20 talks about the gray hairs, not as being something to be, be sad about, but as being a crown to us. That's, that's, that's quite something, isn't it? Uh, the glory of a young man is his strength, that, that drive, that get up and go, to, to, you know, to go out and get things done. The glory of the old man, is his gray head, which speaks of the, 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 the hard years that he has labored in the heat of the sun, and that speaks of the, the experience and the wisdom that he's accumulated over that time. So what can come then, potentially, is, 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 is a certain calm, a, a, a wisdom, a, a perspective, an acceptance, a having seen God's hand at work in one's life, a, a, a sense of the bigger picture, where once one might have, have rushed in and you know, caused havoc in a particular situation, uh, and appreciation that actually there might be, there might be a wiser and, and, and more measured approach to take. The, in, the impetuosity of youth is gone, and we're no longer perhaps trying, trying so hard in a bad way, Um, we're we're no longer perhaps falling over ourselves uh, in quite the way that we did when we were younger. And perhaps we have too a deeper longing for what is to come. And that's right. We've thought about many of the important aspects of focusing on today and the opportunities, and that is completely right, isn't it? But there is also the importance of having this vision, that it was for the vision set before him that the Lord Jesus endured the cross and despised the shame. And uh, sometimes, again, because of that busyness, because of that self-obsession, um, in earlier years, we may, we, that, that vision may not be as bright as it should be. And perhaps as we age, the longing for what is to come, which is thoroughly right and should be inculcated in all of us, 
Perhaps that is stronger. Perhaps we have this potential for a greater appreciation of the eternal. And all these things then are spiritual qualities that we can develop in old age that might be much harder to develop in the earlier years. Perhaps now there is less uh, self-reliance and a greater perception of need. And if those are the potentials then of old age, and if, uh, if our gray hairs are to be a crown for us, what does that mean about how the younger, the, you know, the rest of us should treat those who are old? Well, the scriptures are not backwards in coming forwards on that subject, are they? They talk in many places, Old and New Testaments, about the importance of respecting the, the aged favoring the young and respecting the old um, in one passage. Uh, older people are to be entreated and not rebuked. They're to be honored. The younger are to submit to the elder, um, you know, not regarding them as, as, as has-beens and, well, you had your opportunity and now it's my chance to do my thing. Um, that, that kind of attitude you know, that you'd never get that from the scriptural passages that speak about this topic, would you? So for us as younger people or middle-aged people, um, we need to think carefully about that and we need to discuss it together, don't we? About how we, how we do that, how we put that command of, of, of honoring um, the, the, the old and those who have served for all those years uh, in, uh, in, in their daily lives, in, in the practicalities of life, and how we do so in an ecclesial context also. Now, it's interesting that um, the opportunities that we have in these latter years are greater than they've ever been. And some of that is to do, well, I suppose it's, a lot of it is to do really with, with, with developments in, in, in medicine and so forth, isn't it? And the statistics around this are quite staggering. Um, on average, we will live 34 years longer than our great-grandparents. Our lifespan is increasing at, you know, the average human lifespan in the West is increasing at an average of five hours per day. So every day you get another five hours if you're average. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Um, what are we going to do with it? That's the question. You know, a retirement of self-indulgence versus opportunities that there are for spiritual growth and service. There's a, there's, there's a, um, there's a flip side, though, which is interesting because that psalm had talked about, uh, uh, sort of there's, an, there's an irony in this. That psalm had talked, hadn't it, about the days of our years, uh, uh, three score years and ten, and if by reason uh, uh, of strength they be longer, then those years are not so much to be, um, you know, they may not be all that we might hope they would be necessarily. And uh, it, it's interesting, again, this goes back to, you know, stuff in TED Talks and so on about aging, but uh, um, as, as our lifespans have extended, what's happening is other problems that we didn't have before because we would have been dead are now starting to, are now starting to surface. So in a few years' time, there'll be 32 million people in America who are over 80. Uh, you know, so that, what's that? That's one and a half times the population of Australia, isn't it? Um, of these old people, and half of those will have neurologic diseases of some type or other which then has to be addressed. And um, so, so, so it's just interesting how, although it seems in a way, you know, by the cleverness, and, and it, it is wonderful, it is a blessing, isn't it, that, that you know, we can have this higher standard of living and we can extend, extend life, although, although that is a wonderful thing, yet isn't it ironic that as we've done so, as it seems as though mankind is to some extent postponing the, the, the punishment that God has given, yet other things are coming. Um, uh, to, to, to offset that. Um, a couple of points as we draw now to, to a conclusion. And uh, one of them is not, an experience, uh, is not a quote about aging specifically. It's about someone who became sick uh, uh, with, actually with ALS, uh, quite a famous... Uh, um, he became a famous writer. I'm not sure if he was originally a famous writer or if he was a famous something else, a guy called Neil Salinger. Um, ALS is the condition that Stephen Hawking has. 
Uh, and it, just a very tiny phrase that just made a big impact on me. As I diminished, I grew. And he's, of course, talking about the, the, the diminishing of the body in that, in that terrible disease. And, and you know, we can, we can perhaps picture uh, you know, Stephen Hawking and what has happened to him over the years in our mind's eye and think about that diminishing and, you know, what might have been for him. And that's, um, and, and, it, and it seems, a, it, it seems, and it is a terrible thing in one sense, but, but fascinating that this man with that disease, and of course it would not be something for any of us to say, would it? But, uh, um, but for him to say that as he diminished, he grew. Um, grew in his awareness of others, in his awareness of his blessings, and his awareness of the potential um, and the wonders, uh, wonder of life. And I just wonder if that little phrase is something that we can think about in relation to aging. I mean, there is a literal diminishing of height, isn't there? And the diminishing in all the other ways that comes with aging. But it does not mean that we need a diminish um, in a spiritual uh, sense. Um, by any means. Let's conclude with uh, one final, uh, with, uh, with our second uh, passage, and it's Psalm 71. This psalm pulls together the whole of a human life, and so it's, it's very appropriate as the last. Um, I'm going to read you one more passage just to finish, but uh, um, as the last passage that we'll really sort of explore together in these studies. Psalm 71, and let's just quickly look at verse 6. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. So there's the womb then. <coughs> Excuse me. That's where we began. And then just glance at verse 18. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not. So it's the span then, isn't it? It is from the cradle to the grave. This now, you know, we began with that cynical, uh, with those cynical words of Shakespeare, didn't we? Uh, from the mewling and puking to the, to the sans eyes, sans teeth, sans everything uh, uh, of Shakespeare's quotation. But the vision that we have in Psalm 71, which stretches from the cradle to the grave, is quite different because it is one which is conscious of the presence of God through all those stages of life, from even before we were conceived and existed, from before the foundation of the world, God chose us in Christ that we should be sons and daughters of His and before Him in love. And as we approach our years of aging, and if the Lord remains away, death, the Lord will still be with us by our side and present in our lives if we will have him. So, um, so that's the span then from the womb to, to, to old age. And what, uh, what, what I particularly love about this psalm is the way in which David uh, so, this, so this, you know, this is now David. This is the this is the second to last psalm of of the David psalms of books one and book two in the book. Um, so this is David speaking to us as an old man, and 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 saying that continually, in all these stages of life, um, God has been there. Let's that, let's just chase that through the psalm, verse three. Deliver me, O God, from the hand of the wicked. Uh, sorry, that's verse four. Verse three, be thou my strong habitation whereunto I may continually resort. So a prayer then that God would be strong for us, that he would be a home for us, a place where we can go continually every day whenever we need him, whatever our circumstance may be. 
verse 6. Uh, we looked at this one, by thee have I been holden up from the womb. Well, how does he end the verse? My praise shall be continually of thee. David knows what a human life is for, doesn't he? He knows where the focus should be, what the center of a human heart should be. <clears throat> verse 8, let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thy honor all the day. Verse 14, but I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. So, so now he's starting to change things up. He's, he's amping things up here, isn't he? We thought it was continual, that God would be a continual habitation, that he would praise God continually, but actually no. As he diminishes, as his body grows smaller and his capacities grow smaller, his praise will grow more and more to compensate for it. So the, the, the biggest praise can come from the oldest people then, it seems, doesn't it? That's interesting. I will praise thee more and more, David asserts, as he now approaches the end of his days. And verse 15, um, my mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I can't count it, Lord. I can't count them. There's too many for me to count. This is where we get the hymn from, you know, count your many blessings or, or, the, uh, or the hymn, tell out my soul. What it means literally is count out my soul. The, uh, the, the glories of the Lord, unnumbered blessings that I cannot count, give my spirit voice tender to me, the promise of his word in God, my Savior, shall my heart rejoice. And verse 24 now then, as we, as we round out the psalm, my tongue shall also speak of thy righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded, they are brought unto shame that seek my herd. So there's David's desire then uh, to praise God continually uh, through his life. Let's uh, just focus a little bit more in, uh, in, in the, the, two, you know, the two poles here of the experience, the, 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 the youth, the womb, and the old age. Uh, verse 5 and 6 again. So, thou art my hope, O Lord God, thou art my trust from my youth. So that's something for us to aspire to when we're young then, isn't it? To make God our hope and our trust. And then verse 17, which goes along with it. O oh God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto I have declared thy wondrous works. So this idea of God having taught us from our youth. Now, uh, some of us will have been blessed to have been brought up in the truth and to have never known anything different other than uh, the, you know, the, 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 the truth about God. And that is a wonderful blessing, isn't it? That we can say that God has taught us from our youth in that way. Uh, but that's not the only way that God teaches us in terms of the knowledge that we have. God teaches us from our youth in terms of the experiences that, that come about in our lives which have built our brains, to go back into that teenage session, which have built our brains to be the way that they are. God has given us those experiences, and he's done that whether or not we grew up in the truth. Even if we only came to the truth relatively recently, that doesn't mean that God wasn't there before that, does it? Or that he was not shaping the course of our lives to bring us to this wonderful point where we have arrived. Through all those circumstances, God has been giving us the potential, the things that we need to prepare us to be the person that he wants us to be in his kingdom. That's the potential. Uh, that's the opportunity there. So, but, but of course, this only works if we actually learn from those experiences. The only point in having experiences is if we actually learn from them and develop them. Otherwise, we may as well just have stayed in bed, mayn't we? Um, you know, this is and this is this this is a, a, a very uh, a very important point, actually. Um, and I had a little quote about it that was quite good, <laughs> I thought, um, but I can't find it. Just a second. Anyway. Um, but, but I think for each of us, we need to actually do that exercise. We need to think. Uh, imagine getting yourself a piece of paper and writing, in my life, God has taught me that, and then thinking about the days of your years, 
thinking about all the different circumstances, the difficult and the smooth, and what it is that God has taught you about himself and about his son and about yourself and about human beings and about his great plan and about how to interact with others and how to help others. God has taught us many, many things, uh, and we've got to extract the juice out of that, haven't we? Out of those things that if, if we really believe that God is active and has been active in our lives, then we need to, uh, we, we need to make that explicit, uh, that, that learning that we have had uh, from what God has done for us. The only point in having had a past is that we learn from it. I remember once, I, I quite like to listen to audiobooks when I'm in the car on the way to work, and uh, I would listen to one called um, The Lessons of History, and it was like 16 hours of lectures, which was pretty tedious in many ways, um, but I, I, felt, I thought I was pretty ignorant about history, and I wanted to, I wanted to become a bit less ignorant. And uh, I remember the, the, the guy started off by saying, the most uh, important lesson that we learn from history is that uh, we learn nothing from history. And, uh, and uh, you know, of course, it was just a witticism, um, but we don't want that to be true of ourselves, do we? Or else we may as well not have bothered. Well, let's come to what he says about old age. Then, in conclusion, and um, verse, uh, verse 9, cast me not off in mine old age, forsake me not when my strength Fails. Now you can you can under, you can relate to that, can't you? Uh, that you know, if I'm in that condition, that you know how I would want that to be the case, how I would want it to be the case that my family would not do that, that my brothers and sisters would not do that, but most importantly, that the God in heaven would not do that. You know, I don't know if you use the expression cast offs here in Australia. You know, we use it to talk about clothes that go to the charity shop or the thrift store or, you know, the second-hand store. Cast offs, I don't need that anymore. It's, it's, it's out of here. And, and the, the risk that older people can be treated like that well, this prayer from David is that God will never do that with him. And we know, of course, that he won't. Verse um, 18 and 19. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not. Why? Because he's lonely? Because he's scared? Because he's concerned about himself? Well, that would be completely understandable, wouldn't it? But it's not those reasons that he, that he brings out here. His reasons, and this is such a brilliant thing about David here, his reasons are not about him at all, they're about God. Just have a look at that. Until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. He's ambitious, isn't he? He wants to not only, as an older person now, to show God's strength to this generation, to continue to tell out the wonderful blessings of God, but he wants to tell everyone who is to come forevermore of those blessings. And by God's grace, that will be our blessing too when the Lord Jesus Christ returns.